Hey, hey, how's it going, Boyan? Hey, Ryan. I'm doing great now that I see you. I also just realized this thing I'm drinking has 270 milligrams of caffeine, so should be wait, kicking wait. at any moment. You uh, you join in you join in the caffeine crowd. Is it Celsius? Yeah. You know, I've I've been, maybe we can go get sponsored by them. <laughs> yeah, why not? Why not? Um, good to see you, man. Good to see you. Yeah, yeah I'm looking forward, definitely, definitely looking forward to this conversation. Uh, since since there was a little bit of uh, some new nomenclature or say new acronyms kind of manifesting, but uh, you know, I'm uh, on a personal note, I, I will share some of my opinions about acronyms in our industry. So we'll we'll have fun on that one. Um, but hopefully, uh, you're ready to go, ready to get into this. I'm ready. I'm excited to discuss multi-factor verification. I've been using the term for the last few weeks, just in conversations casually, because those are the conversations I have. And, um, you know, people are definitely curious. And so we figured that we'd start talking about it in a broader sense, really use this as an opportunity to get people's perspectives on this whole thing, talking about the distinction between multi-factor authentication and multi-factor verification. What are the differences? What are the similarities? How can they be used in conjunction or alongside each other? And then we're going to also, we're going to do a demo at the end as well. So I'm looking forward to that, uh, to the discussion. Definitely. And I think it would be pretty, pretty beneficial to hear some of your thoughts from those conversations as you, you, you get to sneak in that, that new acronym or those new, new lingo and to see if people are warming to it, if they're, accepting of it or if they're actually seeing the vision behind it so i'll be interested to, to dig a little bit deeper on that as well but because we usually try to keep these at about 20 30 minutes we're going to end up having to go pretty quick uh just to kind of reset the the context i think on what multi multi-factor verification and where it would would fit you and i and and all of hyper we usually do use the identity uh you know the identity chain um being kind of a great analogy of where in your security program, where in your identity security program might you want to target? Where's the common common pitfalls or what is the weakest link? Um, and usually it starts in that life cycle around user onboarding. And I think I think multi multi-factor verification will have a pretty big hit on, on this part of the link uh, or this part of the chain uh authentication there could be something to be debated if that's where it would come into play uh password and mfa reset uh i'm gonna put that in the bucket as possibly a, a, an mfv use case there uh and then around endpoint access I, I don't know if it necessarily fall right there there could be maybe some creative use cases if we were to apply what, yeah. what's your reader your thoughts there yeah i think I think it can apply to all of these depending on the context. And that's what we'll spend some time talking about too. The user onboarding is particularly interesting. You know, there was recently a post by the folks over at uh, know before who do the phishing training, right? And it seems like they didn't know before an employee joined that one of them was a North Korean infiltrator. <laughs> and um, so, so it was just really fascinating scenario where they interviewed somebody and then the person who uh, got the laptop that they shipped to them, you know, get, got access to it. And then the first thing they did was start loading malware onto it, which uh, was really interesting. And so kind of making sure that the person that you interview for a job is the same person that accesses the system on day one of the job is the same person is really important. And that's an area where we're seeing a lot of applicability for multi-factor verification uh, in particular. And so I think it applies to all of these, just depending on the context and the level of risk associated with a particular user's action. There's definitely an um, opportunity for both multi-factor authentication and multi-factor verification across this chain. And the reason that we focus on these four links of the chain in particular is because from all the hundreds of conversations that we've had over the years with identity teams, both big and small, these are the four links that tend to get compromise the most often. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about how do we secure these in particular? You know, it's um, not, not that I was just, I'm trying to find the right word. 
you know, you and I have had talks about a firm. We've talked about the interview fraud in, in the conversation with other customers and, and individuals who actually express the interview fraud problem or the proxy, the proxy interview use case. Um, and I'm mean, hats off for no before for actually posting that information publicly and, and more or less validating that this is a kind of a widespread scenario. And, and yes, granted that the North Korean scenario, which we also had the government give out an, a warning that this was happening, um, was supported as well. So, um, it, it, it gets everybody. Right? Like it just, I think it definitely, maybe this does have the justification for, for the, the MFV or the new acronym, uh, to be driven in a new way of looking at how do you, how do you verify individuals as they're either onboarding, uh, from, from a physical identity to their digital identity. Ditto. So let's talk about, you know, the, the evolution of things, right? So from phishing to social engineering, phishing is nothing new. It's been around for decades. Um, but it's rapidly evolved. Right. Especially you know, when we used to get phishing training, even now or, or last few years, you know, you, you kind of get trained on looking out for grammatical errors or weird looking links and so on and so forth. But nowadays with things like ChatGPT and, and similar tools, you know, they don't make grammatical errors in emails anymore, phishing emails when they send them out. And, you know, th we, we've been talking recently about how we used to differentiate between phishing and spear phishing, where you know phishing is more of like a spray and pray type of approach by the hackers, and spear phishing was where they actually took the time to understand an individual, their role within a company, their geographic location, all that type of contextual data, and then they would craft a specific message for them that is more likely to succeed. Now, if I'm a hacker that traditionally took longer and more effort to do, but now I can just create an agent that's AI based and do all that legwork for me and create that really nifty phishing email and send it to that person automatically. And so we're starting to see these large scale social engineering and help desk attacks start to happen. Yeah, I mean, you, you kind of bring up like all the steps that you would have to do, even if you were to be, let's say, a ethical, non bad bad actor and you have to go perform a pen test and, and you were going to obviously find your success usually even a phishing or spear phishing campaign you would have to do some form of os int and information gathering in all that context what would take a couple days more than a few hours that you would have to invest that is done like that's that you could actually just put a list of names and have agents go out and, and collect all that information for you and make a very very targeted targeted campaign um and yes, I'm almost thinking that all of our emails going forward, there should be zero grammatical errors because some of us really suck at writing and really enjoy having that editor on every communication. So um, th this, I think, I think there's, a, there's, a plus in, there's a plus and a minus to all things, right? Like, yeah. hey, the bad guys get the, the, grammar, the grammatical errors fixed and even us good guys can get our grammatical <laughs> errors fixed. <laughs> my, my average email is like nine words in length. So if anybody ever gets an email from me, that's more than like two sentences. It's probably not me. <laughs> um, so if we were to go beyond just, just that, right. Um, usually there's a side effect. Usually there's a second part of that email campaign or that phishing. And that's usually going to be a man in the middle in essence to try to harvest a credential. Um, I know we were talking quite a bit about evil engine X uh we can post some some links to some videos of some other people showing the demonstrations it's kind of widely been done quite a bit with implementing evil uh evil engine x uh doing phishing campaigns um but usually this is more or less kind of an example of of what that attack would look like right the hope the help desk social engineering um where there's a, a decent flow of um let's say that the bad actor or hacker or persistent threat uh, targets specific individuals, uh, goes and collects the information from social engineering. Uh, and then they escalated to, uh, in this specific case, they escalated their octa privileges to a super user once they gained hold. And then they uh, moved over to uh, obviously lateral movement and pivoting within the environment for data exfiltration, uh, yeah. as well as encryption. Yeah, let's talk about how like this actually works, right? So 
there's freely available tools like Evil Genetics or Madlishka, right, that hackers can use to do these attacks. And if organizations are, you know, doing, um, are using apps like uh, OctaVerify or the Microsoft Authenticator app, anything where you're accepting a push or typing in a six digit code that you get from an app, basically what they'll do is they'll create a, a fake website that looks just like the Microsoft or Okta login page. They'll trick you into going to that website and they'll ask you to type in that code and your password, but it's not really going to Okta, it's really going to the hacker and then they're using it to log into your Okta environment. And that's exactly what they did here. And then once they're in, they're in, right? They can uh, have free reign over the environment, assuming that they're a uh, appropriately privileged user. So, you know, and, and they'll oftentimes they'll send these push notifications out to people, you know, late at night when they're kind of tired or doing something else on the weekend uh, and where they're far more likely to, uh, to accept it. I, I was reading one example where um, the hacker was sending push notifications to an employee and the person wasn't accepting it, right? And then they messaged them on WhatsApp and said like, hey, I'm not gonna stop saying you this until you accept it. And the employee was like, whatever, I'm gonna keep going on with my weekend and just did it. Um, and it only takes one, right? So this is where, uh, even if we're talking about MFA, multi-factor authentication, reducing the reliance on things like OTP and push notifications is critical to prevent these types of attacks. And then there's the entire other attack vector, which is, hey, I'm gonna to pretend to be an employee who just got a brand new phone over the weekend. My MFA app is on my old phone that I traded in at the Apple store and I need to get my new app provisioned. So I'm gonna answer some questions like the last four of my social and I pretend to be this person and, and get a new credential that way from the IT service desk person. Uh, and, and that sets off an entire new uh, set of um, a set of moves that they can then run to, to get access to the sensitive data. Yeah. The, uh, I remember the story about the individual who, uh, who was just being annoyed over and over again and got, got their success after they said, Hey, I'm going to stop doing that. Um, but look, it, also, gets, it gets even more nefarious, right? We've seen instances where, you know, an employee, like a system administrator, right. Is getting, push notifications that they did not initiate, right? And they're not accepting them because they know not to, right? They're security conscious and everything and they're doing the right things. But then what happens is somebody sends them a text message to their phone number with a picture of their kid's school and says, hey, accept that push notification. Now, you know, you're an employee at a company, you, you know, you, sure work is important but families first you're going to accept it right you don't want to risk it and, and so these type of phishing attacks were not they're not they're changing from phishing to extortion um you know if the technology supports that type of uh, access then you know there's a chance that it will happen yeah that's that's when we start getting into threat modeling and the evolution i mean there's there's going to be like we do have solutions right we have solutions to get around these things. Yep. Uh, and then obviously the attack vector is going to shift quite a bit and or move to something else, which is part of this game. This is the whack-a-mole game. We'll go protect this stuff. We'll go cover identity. And then what we'll have to go deal with is most likely more malware or anybody who's just downloading software at random, which we're getting even better at as well. Um, to kind of move some things along, uh, this does build out. Uh, to, to the expansion of the large desk, uh, large scale help desk social engineering attacks. Uh, and then we're still in 23, you know, looking at 78% um, of organizations were targeted still by identity related attacks as well. And now 24, what we're trying to do is bring to light this multi factor verification acronym, view, approach. Um, I will. Yeah, if you want to add anything before I go to the next one, because this is where yeah, we're going to go into the crediting. Recently, that said like 40% of knowledge workers now work remotely. And, and, and so, you know, if, if you're do, that means those people are fully remote. That means you're doing verification of those individuals completely digitally, right? They're no longer 
you know, if, if they get a new phone or, the, or they need to get back into the system because they forgot their password, they're no longer physically walking up to an IT service desk and being helped. They're picking up the phone and go, or going through some other similar process uh, to verify their identity. And oftentimes that is very insecure and relies on just basic questions that they need to answer. And this is, that's an interesting statistic that post our, our pandemic life, right? That we're down to, to the 40%, right? We had that influx of a hundred percent or let's, let's go with 95%. Um, and now we're back down to, to a much lower number, but it's still much, I think, greater than what it was pre pandemic. Right. So going into the level of risk and once again, threat modeling around, how do you manage that with your business? How do you down? How do you manage that with the onboarding? How is that experience for HR as well as for the employee? Is it at the same time as how are you securing your business with these identities? Yeah. Uh, By the way, so what, it, kind of car, what kind of car did you drive in two thousand four? I don't know. I don't, I'm trying to remember. I need to go look at like two thousand four. That was that was an Integra. Okay. I'm not going to give the year, and I'm not giving the market. I'm not giving the make and year. I mean. <laughs> color or whatever you know I, I don't know what account that is your security question for but now people know it oh i don't really care <laughs> that's that i i live by i live by a hypers mantra man everything's got pass keys everything's got some form of mfa and it's knowledge-based question and answers are not answered with anything in reference to personal public data random generation there's a wonderful little command with open SSL that just randomly generate uh, codes in the past pre us having password managers. <laughs> All right. But uh, uh, this is a really interesting concept um, that, that Susan blogged about recently. Uh, and, and she talked about this concept of multi-factor verification, which I really loved actually. Um, and, and it really talks about the importance of using multiple ways of verifying a user's identity when they need access to an account, right? So this is assuming that they're not enrolled in MFA, but you have no way of verifying them in person because, for example, they're a remote employee. And how do you determine that level of risk associated with verifying that person? And how do you actually establish trust in that identity? So this is where I think it's really important to talk about the differentiator between traditional multi-factor authentication and what multi-factor authentication actually means. It is, so I know we, we and this is where I'm going to be the, okay, do we need another acronym? Because we have IDV already today. Um, identity verification does exist. I think it doesn't necessarily fully apply well on the onboarding, on the, the workforce side. Um, historically, IDV has been applied to uh, financials, banking, and the know your customer use cases, not applying in the in the employee or the workforce side, do we need to have another acronym or label to to dictate what I, identity security should really be at its onslaught? Or am I just being that naysayer who says this on the opposing side in which as long as we find ways to do risk assessments and verify identities, uh, in a clean, cohesive, secure manner from a physical to a digital, assuming that that process does contain risk assessments. Not this, I'm, not, I'm not taking a shot at Susan's ideas or anything else. I think we need these things. I just don't know if the industry needs another acronym. What do you think about that? Um, I, I, think, I think in this case it makes sense because MFA is something that we've kind of burned into people's minds over the last decade or so, right? Every advisory, every, everything, every, you know, regulatory body has come out and said, you need MFA, you need MFA, you need MFA. Okay, great. Companies have now deployed MFA, but then we continue to see these massive identity breaches, right? Because the hackers are like, okay, you deployed MFA. That's super. I'm just going to call up the IT help desk and pretend that I'm you, answer some basic questions, and then get into access. So I think that I think this concept of MFV is a really nice evolution that kind of helps people bridge the gap between, you know, okay, it's good that we have MFA, it's absolutely necessary and critical, 
But if we really want to secure that identity chain, it's not going to be enough. And this MFV is, is an evolutionary thing there. Um, I think IDV is a, is a great acronym and, and a concept, but outside of fellow identity nerds like us, right, and fraud folks, they don't really know what it means. Right? I can, um, I can you know, go out on the street and ask people like, hey, do you use MFA? And they'll know what I'm talking about because chances are at their job, they have it. If I go out in the street and say, hey, do you use IDV? They'll look at me, you know, like, I, like I'm from a different planet. Well, and, and to go on the the supportive side is is that IDV is also also isn't something that's applying uh, iteratively or over and over again, right? So IDV is kind of a, a one hit and quit, right? Hey, you've done this one time. Maybe under the MFV umbrella, we're looking at more of a continuous reprompting, not a one time thing. That's exactly it. When I talk to organizations, like you know, I ask them. Hey, when's the last time you're, the company you worked at actually verified your identity? And 99% of the time it's, hey, they did it when I first joined the company 10 years ago and they haven't done it since. I'm like, okay, so if you're a fully remote employee and I'm pretending to be you, they really have no way to truly verify that. And I was, I was talking to uh, one of our customers um, you know, a, a while ago, and they had a really interesting situation during the pandemic where a remote employee, because everybody was remote, unfortunately passed away. And they didn't know that this person had passed away until, you know, three months later when their spouse came to pick up their stuff from the office. And it was just a really fascinating scenario where like, hey, this person hasn't, you know, been active and we haven't tried to re-verify them, you know, in an automated fashion like that. You would think that that, that type of control would automatically occur on, on a regular interval, given certain signals. But in this case, it hadn't. And I talked to a lot of organizations and, you know, they openly admit like, yeah, that could definitely happen here. Yeah, the uh, like any kind of event of that nature. I mean, we could even talk about when we go into here, we'll throw another acronym in there under the IGA context, right? When people's jobs change and entitlements are reissued or or given, like maybe that is at a point in time, a re-verification prompt should be taking place then. Um, yeah. Getting it closer to just in time because I, I've had plenty of conversations with customers and, and, and businesses in which their certification processes for just that the access and, and privilege access at that is something to be desired, right? Like there's room for this to be reviewed a little bit more frequently. And, and maybe MFV is a way to trigger that uh, as an upfront um, requirement. Yeah, and I was really trying to think about how do you talk about the difference between MFV and MFA? And, and the way that it made sense to me at least was MFA verifies the account, right? So if I'm an employee, I have an account with my company I set up my password, I set up my MFA. And then as long as I have those two things or anybody has those two things, they're essentially me, right? So that's MFA. MFV is actually verifying that the person who's holding that credential is the person who's supposed to be owning and holding that credential. So it actually verifies the person, not just the account. Now, verifying the person every single time they access the system is more difficult. It's more friction. But we need to have this continuous way of verifying the person when it need, they need to be verified, when the risk is there. And that's what we'll demo here in a little bit. Um, and then verify the account on a much more regular basis, basically every time they're accessing the system. Yeah, there's... I'm all for it, right? So I, I, as we go through the conversations, obviously I'm going to become a champion of something like MFV uh, because it becomes more or less point in time and, and the friction definition. And I think in the demo kind of will, will illustrate that, hey, if it's a, a high risk scenario or if it's somebody who's getting access to sensitive information, maybe it does require that level of friction because why we, what are we doing this for? We, we need to find ways to mitigate 
all the stuff that we have already talked about in the past, the social engineering attacks, the the insights. And yes, there are authentication techniques that will help. But at the same time, I think what you were explaining and as you were defining it, boy, I was like, the difference is, is possession of the credential versus the identity that is holding that possession of the credential, which is a separation there. That's right. Yeah. So let's, let's walk through an example, right, where we can talk about, you know, where you might use one versus the other. So MFV is typically used for credential enrollment. So setting up MFA, changing your password, you know, uh, uh, making sure that the person who interviewed for the job is the same person who's starting the job on day one or high value transactions, right? If, if I'm logging into my single sign on environment to uh, do basic word processing, great. Let's make that really simple. MFA is good enough for that. But if I'm logging in to do something critical or, you know, access to nuclear codes, then you better make sure that you're verifying the person, not just the account. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, I think, uh, I think what we can do is kind of give an idea, maybe a little visual representation of what a flow would look like, at least in the context or how we have envisioned where MFV would apply in a user's experience or in, say, a, a standard workflow um, as users would log into their device, whether it be their mobile phone or their desktop endpoint. Uh, they're going to ask or uh, request access to, say, AWS. We're going to use this as a console. Um, we all have businesses that are built on some form of Azure or AWS or some cloud footprint, which has a lot of sensitive data. There's a lot of cloud services that have sensitive data. I'm not going to say names. Um, you know, that may require this type of re-verification uh, before you grant that access. Uh, and if that individual is unable to re-verify, you deny them. Um, maybe it's a reissuance of a credential. Yeah, and when you know when we were all in an office all the time, this was this happened almost out of the box, right? Where in order to access the corporate infrastructure, you had to be physically on the corporate network behind the four walls. And not too long ago, like if you wanted VPN access, it was like you were part of a small group of people who had VPN access. It wasn't the entire company. I remember when the pandemic was really starting to kick off in earnest. Um, I was talking to a, a CTO of a large company and he's like, you know, we just had to spin up from 3000 VPN connections to 300,000 VPN connections because their company is that big. And like, that was the big engineering hurdle for them at, at that time. But, you know, now a lot of the infrastructure that every business relies on is on AWS or Azure or GCP. And so, it's, you know, it's perfectly acceptable that somebody logging in to access the CRM like Salesforce, let's have them use MFA to log into that, preferably the phishing resistant kind. But then if they're accessing, you know, our AWS console where they can turn down, you know, all the servers, turn off all the servers, then let's make sure that we re-verify them. And by the way, especially if they're doing this at a weird time of day, and from a location that they're not usually coming from. Oh, yeah, you, you're bringing up that story about spinning up from 3,000 VPN connections to 300,000. All I was thinking about was, I wonder if they also had to figure out their, cyber, uh, their, their fiber lines into the offices because they're probably running VPN servers inside their own data centers. All the other downstream things that come from that, that, uh, that challenge that they all had to encounter there. But once again, we, we've been talking about identity as the parameter since or like 2010, if not longer than that. And I think this is just manifested, right? The pandemic just showed that, that the identities are going to be floating out there. It is the perimeter. It's not necessarily VPNs. It's not necessarily um, where now we have to move to SASE. It's, it is cloud access. It is, this data is readily available and we've seen, and we have plenty of evidence of the impact of when these cloud services are accessed inappropriately. Um, but let, let's let's see what it would look like if your user um, having to go through this process. I will uh, stop yeah, this. While Ryan is spinning that up, you know what will happen here is basically what you see here on the screen, which is user logs in, um, and then when they go to access a, a sensitive application, they'll have to go through a MFV process, right? And this kind of, this happens all in line. It's not like 
they have to, you know, call up an IT service desk or do something um, completely um, uh, different. Uh, it's just a video of an employee logging in with MFA. Um, and then when they try to access AWS, they, um, they have to go through an additional verification step. All right. So this is going to, there will be a little bit of high speed speaking. Uh, you, you do get to have uh, the voice of me. This is going to be me actually accessing our environment, um, logging in. And we do use uh, pass keys here to authenticate. So even with the security of a pass key being in place, um, we still want to do a verification post because I'm accessing or I'm going to make a request to AWS. So yes, great security with a pass key. Nice, easy, great experience for me as a user, just using my touch ID. It was previously registered through Hyper. And then now I'm going to make my request for my AWS um, access. Now, what that does is it takes in context of risk. All right, well, Ryan logged in with a pass key. Is that pass key synced or has it, is it a device bound pass key? Is it the right time of day? Is it the, you know, what is he attempting to access? Ryan's working at 2 a.m. Is that a normal thing? <laughs> well, yes. See, seems to be a pattern from time to time. So it would be legitimate, right? Um, so we can take it through an identity verification. Like we're going to redo a verification, making sure I have possession of the device delivered with an SMS. We're going to check location data as well, making sure that I am operating from that place during this verification. So um, as Susan was outlining, like risk checks along the way as we go through this, we are also going to do an automated dock off um, component, right? I am, yes, it's a little bit of a challenge because I want to be productive, but I'm going to go ahead and use my driver's license, uh, as well as a selfie in order to match. And, uh, you know, this goes into context. I'm going to have a successful re-verification. I did speed that part up, but the, the portion of this that matters is now once that has been completed and the verification of that identity is done, I can then be access. I can then have access to the resources in a secure way, as well as there's auditability, right? So I just went through that verification, the success of that document authentication as well. And I can be re, uh, you know, reattested back into the environment and accessing this data. So I think there's also a component to this flow, boy, on that we don't really talk a lot about, like we're talking about the action of verifying somebody, but I think it's the attestation component at the end as well. That's pretty important that when, Ryan was accessing AWS. He did go through this flow and here's the evidence of that. Yeah. Yeah. This is the, the critical thing, right? Which is like, Hey, usually when Ryan is trying to access AWS before using MFV, right? So he'll log into his single sign on. He will then go to log into AWS and it might ask him to do his MFA again. But if the hacker already has his MFA, then that's not really an additional factor of authentication. Your know, game's over anyway. So what we can do here is we can say, okay, you use MFA to get into your single sign-on, but then when you try to access this critical system, you know, at a, at a weird time of day, we'll then ask you to also verify your phone number, verify your location, and provide us with your driver's license with a face match. Because I need to know that the person who did MFA is also the, per the right person who should be owning that MFA credential. And companies right now don't really have a way to do that unless they're doing multi-factor verification. Yeah, I think I think there's actually another another twist to that equation, right? Like you're, we're talking about the, also the level of authenticator. As much as I think you and I promote pass keys, phishing resistant authenticators, most of the industry hasn't gotten to the full adoption speed. Obviously, we're going to be excited in, at Authenticate 2024, where we're going to hear more and more companies have done pass keys. But we're in a, that, still in that transition adoption phase, which means we need to be able to mitigate situations where non-phishing resistant MFA is still deployed. So I think this actually helps out in that equation as well, because if we were to kind of go back to the um, successful campaigns that we have had reported to the news, if they had even injected this into that flow, that would have stopped the individuals that would, the, the bad actors in, in midstream, mid path, right? Um, because it would have taken and verified the identity. Granted there's fiction, there's friction involved, 
but it would have forced a re-verification of that identity, which those bad actors wouldn't have had. They would have had a session token at one point in time, but they wouldn't be able to do anything else with it. That's right. And like what you can do is, you know, to leverage, to go back to that no before example earlier, is you can use MFV when you're interviewing somebody and then use MFV after they start to make sure that it is indeed the same person and then use that as an anchor of trust for downstream sensitive actions or re-verifications. Um, so the possibilities are endless. And I think as we continue to see organizations using more and more uh, remote work uh, and outsourcing more functions external to their business to contractors or third parties, the necessity for both MFA and MFV to be implemented in tandem and used appropriately where necessary um, is going to become critical for business continuity and security and, you know, staying out of the headlines ultimately. And I think it's also the evolution of identity. We're getting to that point where we, we've gotten some of the authentication down. I think we all know the, the plan forward is pass keys and it's on to the next part of who actually has that possession of that pass key. Absolutely. And we went overtime though. We were having too much fun, boy. We went way beyond the 20 minutes. We even broke our 30 minute barrier. We're about 37 minutes deep. I had a good time. It goes really quick. It always, always fun when we get to play with these new things. Uh, even if it is me, um, you know, doing a, a video demo, uh, you know, I think seeing it in action and, and verif you know, validating that this, this may not be that bad if you inject that friction at the, the benefit of the security. Right. Um, I'll leave you with your final thoughts as you, I'm pretty sure you want to run off and uh, go on to the, the next things that are on your list in calendar, which is always full. You know, man. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for doing this again. This is awesome. Lots of fun. Hopefully to the folks who are watching, you found it beneficial, kind of understand what the difference differences between MFA and MFV are. As always, Ryan and I, all of Hyper, we're here to uh, help and assist with any of these things and any ideas or guidance or thoughts that you have to make this more clear, to make this a better narrative, to make this um, a success at uh, in the industry overall, please let us know. We're here and happy to have a conversation anytime. Oh, we're always open for debates too. Yeah. I want, if, if you got, if you got opposing ideas and, and opinions, I want to hear them as well and make it more fun. 